in the clear. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's 7.30. Um, we can give maybe one minute and then we can begin. So we'll give you some time to settle in. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Well, I'm excited to see this. Yeah. Wonderful. We are very excited <laughs> to do this with you as well. So Beth and I are both of Lebanese descent, but we only met about like eight or nine years ago through our children. But we believe in our heart of hearts that we're related. We just haven't <laughs> fully identified the family tree yet, but we love to cook. Every Christmas we make pans of Batlewe and we are, uh, we're here to learn and have fun and say hello. Yes. Oh my, that's wonderful. So <laughs> great to meet you. Do, do, do you live in Middleton? Uh, we're on the east side of Madison. Beth is in Cottage Grove and I am here on the east side. Wow. Wonderful. Welcome. Oh, Welcome. That's, that's, that's so great. I lived on the east side for, for about 10 years before we moved here. Oh, uh, really? Yes, awesome. Well, we're excited. Thank you. All right, awesome. I think we can begin. So let's do introductions and then we're going to get to cooking and talking about Lebanon and answering any questions you have. So, so I'm Edmund Ramley. I have been in the Madison area for about 15 years. Moved here from Lebanon. I grew up born and raised in Lebanon, moved here from Lebanon when I was about 20 years old. And uh, uh, yeah, been, been, been in Madison for quite a, quite a while. Really love it here. Uh, I, I came here for grad school and I'm now a professor at the, uh, at the university. Uh, and Claudia? I'm Claudia Ramli and I moved here three years ago fell in love and moved here. Uh, I was born and raised in Lebanon, spent all my childhood there. And I work as a, a consultant for a health policy company. So we're both in the healthcare field and we both love cooking. Um, and we try as much as possible to cook Lebanese food. That's right. And surprisingly, it's really easy to find ingredients around here and some mm -hmm. alternatives. So what are we gonna do today? Well, we are going to make uh, two pretty iconic Lebanese uh, uh, dishes. One is tabbouleh, which is a salad primarily made of parsley, tomatoes, uh, and a bunch of other delicious things. And uh, a, 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 a flat bread, kind of like a pizza, but kind of a Lebanese version of that that's pretty basic, called manouche. Claudia, what's in the manouche? Yes, so manouche is... I love to describe it as the common breakfast among all Lebanese. So whether whether someone's rich or poor, from different you know religions, everyone unites around the manouche. Um, as Edmund said, it is a flatbread, so we have it for breakfast if we're you know heading to work or going to university, and it is super cheap. That's how we know it, at least. Now, unfortunately, you know Lebanon's going through a an economic crisis, but that's another story. But it is super super cheap and We'll show you how to make a very simple, quick menouche. Um, it's breakfast. If you're in our house, sometimes you have it for dinner. Um, and we will also show you the way we make it extra. So in Lebanon, we say we want menouche extra. And that has a lot of um, good stuff like cheese and tomatoes. Right. Mm. You, you have a special way of uh, eating menouche with olives and- uh, Oh, right. Yeah, we'll, I'll talk about that when we get to it. Sure. So that, that's what we're going to make today. And um, we're talking about the best way, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to share them in the chat. As we go, we'll also create uh, opportunities. Yeah, I would say uh, 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 as long as it's manageable, feel free to jump in with questions. Uh, the, these, these dishes are fairly uh, quick to make. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we're, we're gonna have some, some time to chat. So feel free to jump in with questions. Just unmute yourself and ask your question. If, uh, if we start having too many questions, Liz will help us uh, uh, manage that a little bit. You might put uh, a question in the chat and she might read it out to us. Uh, the way we've got the camera set up, hard for us to read the chat, but uh, Liz will be, will be watching for that in case there's someone who would rather put a question in the chat rather than unmuting and, and asking the question uh, live. So. Uh, are there any any questions or or comments or thoughts before we we dive in? All right, 
That sounds good. I think Liz shared the recipes in the chat. Yes. Yes, fantastic. So you have the recipes. And so today we're going to do one dish that needs a bit of work and the other that's quick to do. So depending on, on what, um, you know, how much time you have. So let's start with the um, famous royal tabbouleh of Lebanon. So there's a huge debate, I think, worldwide debate on what tabbouleh really is. And um, I don't think there's a wrong tabbouleh, but there is a Lebanese tabbouleh. And it's just like, you know, the debate of whether to put pineapple on, on um, pizza, pizza. <laughs> for the Italians. So in, in Lebanon, like very, very proud of their tabbouleh and cucumbers is a no-no. So if you ever are on social media and you want you know, to irritate the Lebanese, say, hey, I made tabbouleh with cucumbers. <laughs> that is a disaster. Which is not to say that it, it, it can't be tasty to have cucumbers and tabbouleh. It's just in Lebanon, tabbouleh consists of just a few ingredients. Parsley, mm -hmm. and usually we use flat leaf parsley. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't get it, uh, uh, acquainted with uh, curly leaf parsley until I moved here. Uh, Lebanon is all flat leaf parsley. It, it does help with the texture of the salad and it's, uh, it's easier to chop finely. Uh, we happened to only find curly leaf parsley this time around, but usually it's, it's fairly easy to find in grocery stores. Uh, so uh, parsley, tomatoes, and uh, we're gonna chop these uh, uh, sm in small cubes. Uh, green onions or, or regular yellow onions. Some people also put a combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna be using green onions today. And we just use the white parts. The, the other parts will end up chopping up and putting in eggs or something like that. And then um, lemon. This happens to be a lemon from our indoor lemon tree, uh, our very first lemon. So we'll be using this one. Yeah. And we do have some juiced lemon from before as well. Uh, and then bulgur. So bulgur is, is cracked wheat. And um, in Lebanese tabbouleh, we don't use as much of it as mm -hmm. in North African tabbouleh, where you might have seen it's, it, it, there's a lot of bulgur. It, it's, it's like a, a, a more hearty salad. In, in Lebanese tabbouleh, we use a, a sm much smaller amount of, uh, of bulgur. A little bit of, of mint. Uh, the, the, these are, this is actually from, from our mint plant. Um, normally we would have wanted a little bit more, didn't find any in the grocery store. And then uh, salt, pepper, uh, lemon juice, and uh, olive oil. Uh, and we have a question from Michelle. That's a good question. We use fine or medium bulgur for tabbouleh. Usually fine is best. So, all right, so we're going to begin with the two basic um, items. So the first trick, is we start with the bulgur and you need to soak the bulgur so that it's ready to be edible. So we soak it with lemon juice and also to get extra flavor, we soak it with the tomatoes. So Edmund's going to dice the tomatoes into small cubes and I'm going to um, soak the bulgur with some lemon juice, all right? So, so some people will prepare the bulgur in a bowl with water uh, over a, a couple of hours to, to, to let it kind of soak up and, and, and uh, uh, like get, uh, get puffy, I guess. Uh, others uh, will just put it in the bottom of the bowl and then start chopping up the tomatoes mm -hmm. and putting the tomatoes on top. And by the time you're done chopping up other things like parsley and so on, the bulgur has soaked up the, the acidic juices of the tomatoes. And that's, that's done the same, the same thing as you would have done with the soaking in water. So we tend to not soak in water. And that's, that's way the bulgur can be more flavorful, yeah. both puffed up and more flavorful. And then a little bit of, uh, of lemon juice from the beginning helps with that as well. But, but, but even just the tomato juices are more than enough. So I'm gonna start chopping tomatoes. And uh, Claude is going to put the bulgur in the bowl, and then we'll, we'll start chopping the parsley. So I'll show you how much. So this is the fine bulgur that we get. I think there are a lot of stores that have this. We buy it from the um, Istanbul market. And I... Which is near Whitman on the uh, west side. Right, yes. And so I put just a little bit. So as you can see, let me 
find the best position on the camera. So just a little bit, I would say two tablespoons. And we already squeezed some lemon juice. So just for just a bit and give it a good mix. And so now it's going to sit and soak. All right, so I'll let it wait. And Edmund, while he's dicing the tomatoes, will be adding them into the- um, As I go. As he goes. Uh, so, so we're dicing the tomatoes fairly small. It doesn't matter too much, but it's nice if you get a bunch of different uh, vegetables in, 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 a, in a bite full. So fairly small for the dicing. And I find that to get tomatoes diced so finely, it's nice to use a little serrated knife rather than a big kitchen knife. Although this works too, especially if it's well uh, sharpened. And so Claudia is gonna show you how uh, we chop the parsley. All right, for the parsley, every Lebanese house has a lot of those rubber bands um, because that's how, after we wash the parsley, we put them, you know, in bunches and then we do you want to talk about sort of how you get them set up in bunches you, you get the heights right right yeah that's a good yes that's a good question of uh, good point so what i what we do is we make sure they're bunched up um, in a way that when we chop off the stems we don't get a lot of stems we just need you know the leaves so i will show you how it begins so there this is my rubber band it's not very complicated i just chop up the stems that I don't need, keep just a tiny bit, and then I make sure they're all close together and I chop very finely. So you just make sure you pinch them with your hands so that you know the leaves don't just run away and then we chop. So I'm going to chop a bit and then I'll show you what we're looking for. So, and it really is, um, um how, how to say it it's, it's talent like if you are in a lebanese house everyone looks at the tabbouleh how finely chopped it is so this is the mark of a you know good cook in lebanese houses my mom i can hear her she's not here but i can hear her say um uh, don't chop them a lot because then it won't taste good so right so so <laughs> so, so so it's a fine balance because if you if you you don't, you're not mincing, right? right? Because if you mince, then it, it kind of crushes the parsley and it loses some of that fresh flavor. So it's really, it's really chopped. And, and Claudia will show you kind of the size of a typical uh, piece, but it's not minced. Yeah. So, so we're, we're not trying to crush them. Uh, so, so a nice uh, sharpened knife helps with that. So just to show you, this is what we're looking for, right? So you can't see the leaf. And actually it's preferable when you're eating that you don't see the actual parsley leaf. So that's how they should be. Just cut very, very thinly. But definitely still having maintained their integrity and not right. being uh, uh, mixed yeah. or crushed, yeah. yeah. All right, smells fantastic. I love the smell of parsley. So tabbouleh is a very nice and summery blend of flavors. Um, so every so often when, it, when it's winter and we feel like having a fresh, uh, uh, a fresh sort of taste of summer will we'll make the wood. During the summer, so this summer, this spring, this past spring, we, we grew our first garden uh, here in Bach Community Garden next to us. We had a little plot and we grew a garden for the first time. We had parsley and tomatoes. And so we made the buoy from our garden a uh, couple, couple times a week probably. Yeah. And that was such a treat to eat it fresh from the garden. Yeah. All right, so here we go. It's the bulgur is beautifully soaked. And then we have our, we add the tomatoes. So if you can see, they're, you know, very small, diced. And then we start adding the parsley on the side. So I'm going to do this very elegantly. So it is a salad, but it's not, it's not kind of like, you know, in, in a, um, a regular salad where the tomatoes might be bigger and uh, like the lettuce leaves are bigger. Here, everything is small, everything is small. And we'll tell you how people tend to eat this. Mm -hmm. So so you might eat it with, with pita bread, kind of uh, grabbing little bites of it with, with pita bread. 
uh, a lot of people eat it with leaves of lettuce, sort of using that to grab, or leaves of, of cabbage. We don't have any of that right now, otherwise we would have made, done a demonstration, but you can, you can just eat it with the, the fork just as well. Great, I'm doing another round of parsley, although I think this is going to be a, a lot. So as Edmund said earlier, Lebanese tabbouleh does not have a lot of bulgur. It's really tiny. So we're talking two tablespoons, and then we have two tomatoes and probably two, um, two, bunches, of two parsley. bunches of parsley. So the Lebanese tabbouleh, you can say, is parsley, mostly parsley. So that's a trick. That's why there's always that debate. No, this isn't tabbouleh. It's not Lebanese tabbouleh if it has more bulgur. Um, Whereas uh, Moroccan or Algerian tabbouleh commonly has uh, as much bulgur as it has right, parsley. So, right. so it's going to look more, more white or brown than, than green. Whereas the, the Lebanese tabbouleh is going to look primarily green with some spots of orange for the tomato. Yeah. Can I uh, interrupt to ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Did you say the recipe is somewhere that we can be looking at? Yes, it's in the chat. Liz just put a link to the PDF in the chat. Mm -hmm. L please let us know if, if you can't get to it. We have the actual measurements there, so you can also have a better idea. Although typically when we make tabbouleh, we, we, it, it's, we don't use measurements, it's, it's more. Yeah to taste, yeah. but it's because we've we've tasted thousands of tabbouleh, so we kind of know what we're looking for. Um, but yeah, uh, Claudia's got th those measurements in, in that uh, in that recipe there. Let us know if you can't access it. All right, so, so far we have bulgur soaked in lemon juice. We have the tomatoes also soaking with the rest, and then we've got the chopped parsley. So the fourth thing we can add are green onions. And so they're washed, we cut off the tip, and we also, I mean, you can just chop it as they are, they're already tiny. Now I know my grandma, mm -hmm. I actually texted her today just to check. Um, she adds, and I'm gonna ask Edmund if he knows a, uh, an alternative, we add sweet pepper with yeah. the chopped onions um, and just a bit of salt, give them a good mix, and then we put them with the rest. So what could be an alternative for sweet pepper? So allspice, uh, a half and half mix of allspice and black pepper uh, gets pretty close to the kind of the table pepper that we use in Lebanon, which is kind of this brown pepper. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to say about the green onions is some people will cut it length lengthwise uh, before uh, chopping it finely, like what Claude is doing. Uh, it depends on whether you want more of that sort of oniony flavor in the bites, or you want it to blend in more. So, 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 so both both are fine depending on on flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so I'm done with the tomatoes. All right. So we've got tomatoes ready. I'm going to add the sweet pepper. Just give them a good mix. We like to mix our salads by hand. If you go up to the villages in Lebanon, you see. Um, there's another salad called katouche, and really mixing it by hand and not, not with utensils. So I've got um, the green onions, and I'm going to add a few more. And then we'll put the secret ingredients. So I did, yeah. So, so far, um, and, and, and oftentimes people will prepare this in advance of mixing it. So we don't have any oil just yet. And the uh, the lemon juice is just with the bulgur and the tomatoes. So we don't want it to soak up the, the parsley and let it wilt. Uh, in our case, we're just gonna eat it right away. But if you wanted to make it and then mix it when your guests arrive, you kind of keep them separate like this and, and then mix it when you're ready to eat. All right. so. That's it. I used four um, green onions, just a bit for extra flavor. But again, it depends on how much, like if you like onion right. or, uh, or lemon juice. So No garlic in tabbouleh. Uh, yeah, so so if you like that, that garlicky flavor, then green onions rather mm -hmm. than yellow onions. If not, then just yellow onions or white onions, uh, typically white onions. 
problem. Uh, not read on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the secret ingredient that Claudia was talking about that some people use uh, is lemon zest. So I'm going to zest a lemon. Can just over. Yeah. Grab yeah. Good point. Yeah. So just an extra flavor. We have a question. Do you have a fatouche? Yes. We can definitely share a fatouche recipe uh, at the end with pleasure. Yeah. We it's, can also probably come back and make fatouche. Yes. It's my favorite favorite salad. Fatouche is all the vegetables you can find um, in you know in a Lebanese garden, which is. Just the basic. We'll, we'll talk. We'll give you a recipe at the end. Remind me, Edmund. Yeah, for sure. F fun thing about fatouche, the reason why it's called that is the word fatouche is based on the word fete, which means breadcrumb, uh, particularly a crumb of pita bread. So fatouche is a salad that you make when you've got uh, leftover pita bread that has gone sort of a little bit uh, um, kind of dry and, and crackly. And you might toast it up or you might let it, let it dry some more and then crack it. And those cracks of bread, so it's, it's not bread crumbs, it's kind of cracks of bread uh, are essential to fatouche. And then the rest of fatouche is uh, lettuce, uh, uh, lettuce, radish, tomato, uh, cucumbers, sometimes uh, sweet peppers. Um, Personally. Purslane, which, which, is, which is a weed here, but we actually use it in Lebanon. So we ended up making a lot of fatouche this summer because we had a lot of purslane in the garden. And secret ingredient in fatouche is pomegranate molasses, which you can find at Istanbul market and a lot of uh, other places. Yeah, it gives it a lovely, lovely flavor. Pomegranate molasses. Um, and then the usual, lemon, did you say lemon juice, olive oil, salt, and pepper? Um, yeah. uh, le lemon olive uh, uh, lemon olive dressing is very common in Lebanese salad. Mm. In fact, in Lebanese cooking in general. Mm. So lemon olive uh, dressing for salad. A lot of times, lemon olive garlic dressing for um, different things like... Uh, uh, how, how would you describe tabbal? Kind of seasoned, se se seasoned cold food. Yeah. Like you might, you might, you might serve uh, white beans with lemon, garlic, olive oil. Like a marinade. Of uh, kind of like a yeah. It's not a marinade as much as a seasoning. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 white beans with lemon, garlic, olive oil, and that's it. And eat it with pita bread is a very nice fresh summery thing. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're almost done with the tabbouleh. Um, it's very simple. It's, it takes some time just dicing and chopping, but it is super refreshing, very healthy. Um, when we talk about Lebanese meze, um, we'll, we'll show you some pictures at the end. It's, it's just a long table of cold appetizers and tabbouleh is always present. As yeah, so meze salad. is kind of like Spanish tapas mm -hmm. or or like you know appetizers, except it's a whole table of, of appetizers. And I don't know if you know, knew this. The word meze comes from the Spanish word mesa, mesa, oh, just oh, table. Oh no, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. yeah, because because uh, Arabic and Spanish actually intermingled quite a bit when uh, during one of the older centuries, kind of around like mid mid thousands, I want to say. So someone Do saying, have a question? no, just a comment that um, they had one at potluck and they were wondering if it was probably pomegranate molasses. It's like the secret ingredient. You don't have to put it there. Some, some Lebanese families don't, but it really gives it an extra kick when you do. Um, what else could, yeah, I think just that, that would be a secret ingredient for fatouche. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. Oh, oh, sumac. Oh my, of course. Oh, well, you can't, you can't oh, have oh, without we're, so we're terrible Lebanese. Uh, so, so Claudia's family in Lebanon, in the south of Lebanon, um, uh, makes their own uh, olive oil, actually. They have olive groves, as well as they make their own, their own sumac from sumac trees. We're not sure if the sumac trees here are mm -hmm. the same as the sumac trees in Lebanon. There are some here. We haven't tried to make but yeah, sumac gives a nice kind of acidic flavor to yes. fatouche. So definitely you can't have fatouche without 
the sumac and the um, pita, the roasted pita bread. So, all right, we're done with our tabbouleh. So mixed. And again, like Edmund said, if you don't want to serve it now, you can put it in the fridge. It, it stays very well. And then once you're ready, we add some lemon juice. In fact, maybe we let it sit since we're going to watch some slides. Sure. Make, uh, and then we'll mix it at the end when we're ready to eat. Sure. How does that sound? Okay, that sounds good. Yes, we'll make it at the end. Um, any questions? We have some um, pictures of Lebanon to share with you before we move to the next dish. So we're happy to answer any questions you have. Claudia, I'm a little traumatized. My family has put cucumbers <laughs> into the bully for generations and all my grandparents came from Lebanon. And I have to call my mom after this and say, what is going on? There, there are for sure villages in Lebanon that do that. Uh, well, it's not, it's not it's common. Not the traditional one. Yeah, it's just like Hawaiian pizza, you know? I heard die in Zahlai, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I am part of the Lebanese cooking group on Facebook. And when I see someone, you know, innocently put a picture of tabbouleh with cucumbers, I'm like, oh my God, good luck. The comments are so, they're so, no one's like, it's so bad. So, but it's not a, it's not a wrong thing. It's just not the traditional tabbouleh. Mm -hmm. um, Which is not to say that there aren't people in Lebanon who do that. Yeah. But but I guess <laughs> they're just um, wrong. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just huge uh, it's not it's not as common. Yeah. Um, so one last thing before we conclude the tabbouleh is it's optional. Sometimes we have a hard time finding mint uh, leaves in, in, in grocery stores here, but you can add some mint leaves, um, not a lot, so it doesn't overpower the actual flavor to tabbouleh. Chopped very finely. Chopped very finely. Yes. <laughs> Um, someone was someone singing when they were growing up in Michigan, Michigan, they were always warned to stay away from the poison sumac plants. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I wonder. Maybe it's a different plant. Could be, could be. We have a, well, my, my family has a sumac tree in Lebanon and people steal from it. It's like, it's a really good uh, plant. So when I first moved here to Wisconsin and we see them out there, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? But it might be a different. Uh, so we have some pictures for you. Oh, we mentioned the Istanbul market. What other stores do we shop? Yeah. Yeah. So Asian Midway mm -hmm. on South Park has, you know, some of the basic staples like pita bread and yeah. uh, labne, which is kind of this uh, firm uh, sour yogurt, uh, kind of like, like a cream cheese, but, but, but it's a Lebanese uh, uh, thing that like we, we eat as a spread on, on pita. Uh, other things that we get from Asian Midway or Istanbul would be za'atar, which is the thyme mm. mixture that we'll show you that we put in, in the um, manushi. Uh, olive, uh, olives, like sort of marinated olives. Uh, what are other things that we get? From uh, we're thinking Vulgar. Vulgar, yeah. Any other Pomegranate stores mal other than Asian? Mid other Korea, stores than Istanbul. Asian and Istanbul. There are a lot. Those are the ones that, that we tend to go to, but there are several. There are several, uh, many, many of the uh, ethnic food stores in town will have a Middle Eastern section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, those are the ones we know about. Yeah, those are the yeah. ones we, we, we go to because yeah. we, th th there hasn't been anything we've looked for that we haven't found. Um, all right, so if there aren't any more questions, and feel free, if something popped up, we can stop and, and we wanted to share with you, we made a very, very small slideshow, just of Lebanon, um, some pictures, so let's see. And by we made, Claudia means she made. Claudia will not brag about this, but she uh, uh, created and, and ran a, a walking tour in, in a... Uh, uh, historical traditional part of Beirut in Lebanon called Jemeze that has become kind of big on nightlife these days but she she called it hidden gem which is a play on words because Jemeze and and hidden her hidden gem tour kind of really opens people's eyes both uh, foreigners and and Lebanese about all of the the, the mixture of kind of modern life with 
historical traditional architecture. I think she has some pictures, but I don't think she was gonna <laughs> tell you about it because she doesn't like the brand. So, so always a good excuse to talk about Lebanon. That's why I prepared some, <laughs> some slides. So very, very briefly, um, let's show you where Lebanon is. A lot of people sometimes ask me, where is Lebanon? It's a very small country in the Middle East. Actually, size of Massachusetts. Ooh, size of Massachusetts. About. Mm -hmm. And it's the second smallest country in the whole mid Middle East among all 18 countries. What's the smallest? Uh, Bahrain. Really? OK. It's very much smaller. So um, and as you can see, what is interesting about Lebanon is it has a beautiful coast. So from Tripoli down to Tyr, we have gorgeous beaches. And we'll talk later about pollution, corruption. That's okay. another story. But what I'll share is the Lebanon that I that I love. Um, so and, and we have And this is the coast on the Mediterranean Sea. Right. So the Mediterranean Sea to the south of it has Africa, to the north of it has Europe, and to the east of it has Asia. And so Lebanon, when we learned uh, Lebanese history and geography in, in school, we learned about how it was kind of this pivotal geopolitical location uh, at the intersection of three continents and as the gateway of commerce from the Mediterranean into the rest of uh, the Middle East and Asia. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and one fun fact about Lebanon is it has actually one of the greatest uh, fragments of ancient Rome outside Rome. And I've heard that from Italians themselves. When they come visit Lebanon, they are in awe because they, um, the Roman ru ruins are still very well preserved. And you're looking at a picture of the Temple of Bacchus, which is standing, as you can see, really well maintained. Um, and it is a UNESCO heritage site. So any Lebanese or tourists, that's their, definitely one of their stops when they come visit Lebanon. Here's a view from above. So you can see, you can, if you enjoy ruins, it's really a beautiful place to, to visit. Um, we are known for wine. I don't know if you know about this, but Lebanese, they're very proud of their wine. Um, they um, usually plant French types of grapes, but also have local ones. And they, they um, export outside. So Edmund, you were telling me that you have seen some here. In oh Rome. yeah. So, so uh, um, Riley's Wines of the World is one of, at least one of the stores that will have, will carry Lebanese wine. I think Steve's Liquor on University also does. And um, there's, they, they, they carry some of the, the basic wines like Kefraya and Ksara, as well as some of the award-winning um, um, wines within, within those uh, categories. And, and they, they tend to be knowledgeable about the, the, the award-winning Lebanese wines and can tell you about them. So definitely recommend uh, trying them out if, mm. if, if you like wine. Mm. Um, another fun fact, um, and I never really appreciated this growing up in Lebanon, but when I um, had the walking tour, I would hear tourists like stand in awe when they were here, the um, uh, Islamic um, call to prayer, and then the church bell ringing. Uh, this is how we live in Lebanon. There are 18 different sects from different Christianities, uh, kind of like denominations, denominations, yeah, uh, and, and Muslims, and uh, another called Druze. So we, everyone coexists. Unfortunately, of course, like any country, we had civil war with this coexistence. Um, and we're still, Lebanon is still emerging from that, sadly. But there, you know, there is, there's a lot of coexistence in Lebanon. So this is a, a, a nice picture. You can see the mosque and the church. These are one of the two main ones that- um, In uh, downtown Beirut. Yeah, that, uh, that are, are frequently visited. Um, another fun fact, uh, do you want to talk about that? You sure. like skiing more than yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so an interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize is that Lebanon is, is it the only country in the Middle East with no desert at all? So, so of all the countries in the Middle East, like 18, 18 countries or so, uh, Lebanon is the only country that has no desert at all. It's a country of mountains. Uh, it's a country of 
the 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 very long sort of coastline sort of you, you saw on the map it's a kind of skinny country right the long coastline on the mediterranean and then a big mountain chain in in the middle and then a a valley uh, uh with some uh sort of crop agriculture and then another mountain chain and that's it it's just coast mountain chain valley mountain chain most agriculture in Lebanon is terraced agriculture. So, so it's hills and sort of you have these kind of uh, uh, stepwise uh, terraces and you, you grow primarily uh, trees, fruit trees. So, so apple trees and uh, cherry trees, uh, peaches, plums, apricots. So we grew up eating a lot of fruit and, and really finding it very abundant uh, and, and love that. Uh, and then some crop agriculture in that sort of plain between the mountains. Uh, which is to say that we have very well-developed, six well-developed well ski trails uh, in Lebanon, um, pretty decent. Uh, there's uh, the, the highest peak in Lebanon is, I wanna say 3000 meters. Uh, and the other thing that a lot of people like to brag about <laughs> with Lebanon, although I don't know that a lot of people actually take advantage of that, is that technically speaking, you could go from skiing in the mountains to swimming in the sea within 30 to 45 minutes. Who's going to do that and why? I don't know. <laughs> but that's, that's a big point of pride. Yes. The yes. <laughs> now, if you get stuck in traffic, that's going to take you two hours. When you get stuck in traffic. When you get stuck. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, and then um, another area that is uh, also interesting about Lebanon is Biblos. It's actually, when you research about it, it's one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world. It still has the Phoenician feel to it. Um, and history says that's where the Phoenician alphabet was launched. So it's a beautiful, well-preserved place. You can see pictures um, of Biblos and it is still, it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities around the world. And then of course, we can't talk about Lebanon without, without talking about the capital, Beirut. So um, here's a fun fact, let's, do, let's make it interactive. How many languages um, do you think Lebanese speak? So you can just, write whatever comes at the top of your head in the chat. So let's see how which many languages, which, which languages, not how many, sorry, which languages uh, do Lebanese speak? So I'll give you some time. Fluent. Yes. And while you're doing this, I don't want to miss the question from from Laura, who's saying she doesn't think of Lebanese food as having a lot of seafood in it. Is this true or only true in the US? Mm. That's an interesting point. So uh, along the coastal areas, there, uh, uh, there's a fair amount of eating fish, uh, typically fried fish, sometimes grilled fish. There are some uh, seafood-based uh, dishes uh, with uh, you know, squid and squid ink and, and uh, things like that. I would say the main seafood in Lebanon would be different varieties of fish. And then there is a, a, a traditional dish uh, made that, that you make after you've eaten uh, grilled fish that Claudia's grandma is very good at making. Do you want to talk about siadie? Siadie, yeah. I, th I think it started off as a, uh, a, sorry, kind of as a, a fisherman's, fisherman's food, very humble, but now it is, it's really, you know, if you want to flatter someone, you, you make this. It's uh, basically rice that's cooked with the fish broth and there are some spices in it. Um, I, know, I know my family puts a bit of turmeric to give that, that color, but the fish broth is what gives it this rich uh, rice flavor. And then you sprinkle pine nuts and then the fish. So, but I do think it was a, you know, poor man's food and then it ended up uh, used for just you know to honor guests um so let's see any guesses i'll give you some more time any guesses what are the languages oh okay 
got French, English, Arabic. Michelle. Yeah, you got it. You're right. There's still one more missing, Armenian. There's a huge, huge Armenian um, diaspora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a very large Armenian population from the First World War and the Armenian genocide during, during that period. And a lot of uh, Armenian refugee populations moved into Lebanon and have now been fully integrated uh, third and fourth generation uh, and, and have maintained their language and, 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 and a lot of their food and, and heritage. Uh, the interesting thing about the languages of Lebanon is that there, uh, there are actually two official languages of the Lebanese government. Uh, Arabic and French are official languages of the Lebanese government. And most everybody in Lebanon will be uh, fluent in at least one language other than Arabic, uh, except in, in the distant villages. Uh, and uh, probably half of the population will be fluent in Arabic, English, and French, as we are. And then those who aren't will be fluent in Arabic and English. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, people of Armenian descent will have mm -hmm. Armenian as well. Interesting thing about uh, the way the population in Lebanon is distributed, since I mentioned the villages, is that Lebanon has about three to four million inhabitants. Two million live in the capital city of Beirut. So it's a country of thousands of small villages and very few large cities. Uh, and because it's such a small country, a lot of people even who live in the cities will still have uh, heirloom family homes in the mountains that they visit on the weekends. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's just probably sometimes it's a 30 minute drive. So for us, that is, that is a, a drive. And that when we spend summers in the village, that's 30 minutes away. <laughs> um, so longest uh, road trip in Lebanon would be two to three hours. Yes, exactly. And then you're in another country. All right, a few pictures, and then we'll start with the Mentmushi. Um, so, as Edmund said, you can see this is Beirut reconstructed after the war. Now, the pictures, sadly, it, they look nice, but it really is a ghost town. It's very expensive to live in Beirut after the civil war. In, in downtown Beirut. In least. downtown Beirut. Yeah, that's correct. So you can see it has a bit of the French feel to it because um, Lebanon was was had the French mandate for 20, how many years? So, so 23. 23. So, so, so between uh, 1920, uh, so end of the First World War, uh, when Lebanon gained its in the, uh, pseudo independence from the Ottoman Empire uh, until, and, and then went under French uh, protection until uh, the Second World War, uh, when Lebanon gained its independence from the French in 1943. Oh, it was good having a history expert <laughs> on the cooking show. <laughs> All right, and then those are a few pictures uh, that I took from the walking tour just to show you old Beirut. This is old Beirut. And um, what I personally love, and, um, and I know Edmund also appreciates very much, is the um, those triple windows. So this is how Lebanese houses were. They had the triple windows, the middle one, all well actually the both all three lead you to a huge room where back then families used to gather sometimes two three families would live together and then you and then this big room would take you to you know the bedrooms and the kitchen so th this this is also a picture to show you old beirut um the stairs so you you saw downtown how you know it, it, it appears a bit fake it was recently built super expensive but this is old beirut and again pictures of the the triple windows. So, and again, you can see, so very old, unfortunately, sometimes poorly maintained. A lot of people escaped from the civil war and live uh, abroad. Actually, I forgot the number. I don't know Edmund, if you remember, um, we have more people who live outside of Lebanon. By far, than yeah. Lebanon. So, so there's different estimates that I've heard, but at one time I heard that um, there's more than 20 million people of Lebanese descent living outside of Lebanon and only less than 4 million living in Lebanon. Uh, and then I've also heard estimates that there's like five times as many people of Lebanese descent in Brazil alone yeah. as there are in Lebanon. So 
so it's very hard to get accurate estimates because because I, I don't know who would gather those statistics, certainly not the Lebanese government. Uh, I think the Lebanese government is not even gathering st accurate statistics about the Lebanese no. uh, mm -hmm. population, which actually has political and, and religious Long sort story. Of, yeah. uh, reasons. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, a huge Lebanese diaspora, as we, as we see on the call yeah. uh, outside of Lebanon. Yeah. Um, all right, we have a few minutes, so we're going to show you the last uh, thing on our menu today, which is the menu ship. And we're going to show you the abridged version, the quick one. So if you're in Lebanon, you start with the dough and everything, but we found a great alternative to making menu ship. So I'm going to move our laptop further, and, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the three ingredients that we use. Right. So, so in Lebanon, the menu is not something that you make. In Lebanon, a manbushi is something that you buy at a dedicated oven place, kind of like a, imagine a, 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 traditionally a, a, a wood-fired uh, uh, pizza oven, kind of a big, this kind of tunnel thing where they'll, they'll make the dough and then they'll put it on these long wooden um, panes that they put into the, the oven after they put the ingredients on it. So most basic manushe is za'atar, which is a blend of thyme, uh, sort of uh, fresh thyme that's been dried up uh, with sesame seeds, uh, often sumac, and uh, potentially other herbs. Just salt. So, salt. Uh, and then mm -hmm. so uh, za'atar is going to be mixed with olive oil and uh, pretty generously. So I'm actually going to open this up and I'm going to put a bunch of olive oil in here. And then we're going to mix this up. So Claudia is going to mix it for me. And this is the, the basic paste that we'll put on a basic manmushi. So it should be a paste, not too liquidy. But as you can see, the zata really But still not dry, up. right? So, right. so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty pasty. And, and if, it's, if it's still a little bit dry, you can add some olive oil. Mm -hmm. And you can find za'atar at Istanbul market. This particular blend of za'atar is from uh, Claudia's family's village. Uh, it's it's uh, sort of homemade. Uh, your mom made this. Right? Yeah, yeah, she likes to mix. So we get the herbs from, uh, from our village and then my mom um, mixes it together. So the trick is rather than making our own dough, which we sometimes do, mm -hmm. but for a quick pick-me-up sort of breakfast or, or dinner, we use pita, Greek pita bread, sort of the gyro bread, which you can buy at most grocery stores in town. Uh, these are from Costco and uh, they freeze very well. So we'll typically keep a couple of bags in the freezer and oftentimes don't even need to thaw it out that much mm -hmm. uh, before using. Yeah. Uh, because the other trick that we use is we have a panini press and you don't have to have one to make uh, this kind of short, quickened version of manushi at home, but it helps if you do. Uh, you can also make it on a pan on the stove. And so, I've just added a little bit of olive oil because this was a little bit dry and I want it to be nicely spreadable. And I'm gonna spread it across the whole thing. Still a little bit dry on this side, so I'm gonna add a tiny bit of olive oil. Um, this is kind of to taste. If you don't want it to be too soggy, you don't have to add that much. Ultimately, when we put it in the panini press, it's gonna sort of drip away. It's uh, and soak its uh, its oil, so I'm not too worried about it. But I don't want it to taste dry, and and that's it. So Claudia's fired up the panini press for me. Um, in Lebanon, this would be kind of the the raw dough with the um, zatar on it, and it would go into the oven and come out ready to eat. And typically, people will fold it in half, kind of like this. Now, uh, in, our, in our situation, because we're using a panini press, I'm gonna fold it, even though it's not raw, raw dough, it's, it's already cooked bread, I'm gonna fold it and just put it in the panini press. 
and then it'll be right, ready to eat. We've, we've succeeded in making it with, uh, with the bread still being not entirely thawed and, and it works. It, mm -hmm. it, it works nicely. So very, very simple recipe. And I promise you, it's, it's, it's the exact taste uh, as that of Lebanon. And proof is when um, my in-laws came to visit, my mother-in-law loved the menouche. She made it pretty much every day. Every day. So that's saying something. That it's really the, the right flavor. And it's very easy to do. So Which in Lebanon, we don't. We just buy it at the store. Because sure. it's, so, it's so ubiquitous. Yeah. So it's, it's more ubiquitous than donuts right or, or bagels it's like everywhere yeah uh, but here we make it at home because it's so easy to make so the other uh, kind so sean says lebanese flatbread from istanbul market is delicious made in chicago yes yes yeah, so. so so that's the pita bread and mm. we don't use that for this we use that to eat our our, our sort of lebanese dishes uh, that is uh, is too thin for what we're going for here here we're going for Kind of more, more, a more doughy pita, which you might be referring to the doughy pita that Istanbul has, uh, and in, in that case, that works great. It's similar to non flat bread, the Indian flat bread. We were experimenting in the beginning and tried that, so the same thickness. Um, and then we found that the Greek gyros is closest to it. Um, so some ideas. That said, we I don't think we've tried the the thick pita bread from Istanbul. No, we haven't. tend to get the, the thin pita bread to eat with with the with the fruit, but we'll we'll try that out. Thanks. So the other kind of menouche is just cheese, and here we we use shredded mozzarella cheese, um, and same thing. I'm gonna fold it and put it in the panini press, and we. Also like, we also like to make half and half. So that's the extra that- um, Or one kind of extra. One kind of extra. That's how I like to have my breakfast in the morning. So half uh, za'atar and then half cheese. And at the end, I slice tomatoes and open the hot um, flat bread and put it in. It's the best. So trust me, if you ever want to try it this way, it's really, really super good. And you can add mint, cucumbers. Um, uh, pickled turnips, which they have at the uh, Istanbul market, and olives. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so delicious. But so, you don't have to put vegetables in. Right. We just recommend it. <laughs> So while Edmund finishes up this, I'm going to mix the tabbouleh and show you how, um, how, it ends up. how it ends up. Claudia also likes sometimes to do kind of a version of the menouche that's more like a pizza. So she'll make the cheese one and add tomato sauce or pizza sauce and a little bit of oregano. It's scandalous. It's, no. <laughs> it, it, it's not a menouche anymore, but, but it's such a nice treat when, when you have that... Uh, that carb craving. Yeah. Yeah. So I just added some uh, olive oil, salt, and again, it's all toothpaste, some lemon juice. Did I like to pepper? add more, not yet. So just add again to taste. Then sweet pepper. I think uh, my grandma adds black pepper to it. And we'll mix. So I'm just going to mix to show you how it looks in the end. So see, you cannot see the, the bulgur anymore. So I'm mixing- It fades in the background. It fades, yeah. It's primarily kind of a, a green thing with a little bit of red. It's a bit Christmassy when you think about it's, it. That's true, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here it is. And again, if you wanna live it, you know, the real uh, Lebanese, you take a spoonful of it and you give it to the person next to you so they can taste the flavor. That is a must in every Lebanese cuisine. So Edmund, can you check if there's anything missing? Mm. Mm. So I can, I can feel the crunch of the parsley, okay. which tells me maybe we need a little bit more uh, olive oil. 
So I've noticed something, that's one uh, point we can share before we take questions, is the parsley here sometimes is a bit um, rough. Especially uh, the curly leaf. That's why we like the, 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 the flat. So if you have that issue, um, we found just adding some salt and sometimes sometimes massaging with your hands, just like you would do with kale, can help. So and just give it time and it becomes tender. So thanks for pinpointing that out. So before we mix, I could have done that. Um, we have a few minutes left. We have five minutes left. So let's take some questions. Um, oh, Manusha Pizza, yes. So maybe we should market it this way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So any questions about what we uh, tried today? What is Minutia pizza? So I think that's what Edwin was mentioning. It's when and, um, and the, the cheese, the melted cheese and yeah. the tomato sauce. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so she's kind of making a version of the Minutia because she likes pizza and she likes Minutia. <laughs> And someone in the chat was saying, oh, great, Manusha pizza. <laughs> Why not, right? Yeah. <laughs> but today you, you learn two types of manusha, the one with zaatar. So and it's done right here. We'll show you. So here it is. It's he heated. The cheese is melted also. So we'll show you how it actually looks if you were to open these up. But really, you would eat them um, kind of like this. And then we've got the one with, with the bland, yep. which, which is our favorite. This is our favorite. And definitely, Edmund, if you could put some um, tomatoes. I love slicing tomatoes in it and cucumbers. Yeah, for sure. Having it with, with vegetables is, is really, really good. Um, thank you, Michelle. Can... If you have any, uh, so Michelle says we, should, we think we should do more of these Zooms. Yeah, that's, that's great. I hope we can do them in person. We would share a um, Lebanese meal together. So hopefully someday. If you have any questions about recipes that you would like us to talk about, we'd also be happy to do that someday. Do you have a falafel recipe? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, actually, we have falafel in the uh, uh, fridge. So my mom makes the falafels. And the only trick is really finding the... Um, um, what's cool? The, the beans. So fava beans, fava which beans. we have found at Istanbul market. So dry fava beans. And my, uh, Claudia's mom actually likes making falafel from scratch uh, and blending it all in, in kind of the food processor and, and turning it into this kind of fine, um, uh, almost flour uh, that, that we then uh, make into balls and, and deep, deep fry. Uh, it, most people in Lebanon wouldn't do that. Most people in Lebanon would buy it again at at, uh, at restaurants and, and food carts, but it's really nice when it's made fresh. And I'm pretty sure we could get your mom's recipe. Yes, I, I would prefer not to give you the, the recipe at the top of my head, but um, <laughs> if, you, if you want, definitely uh, send me your email address offline or by direct message. And I will send you my mom's recipe. She was able to make it here in Madison. So I am she confident. She didn't love our food process. Of but, course. But she, but she, she succeeded. She succeeded, uh, yeah. so, so, so fava beans, garbanzo beans, what else? Um, Loosely. And the, then the, there's the cumin and different. Yeah, there's a different... special falafel spice. OK. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what it is, so I'd rather not share. Uh, OK, we have a. Settle this for us, please. Fatayr or Sfiha? Is Sfiha open? <laughs> uh, yes. I think all of them are correct. It depends on where you are, which village you are in Lebanon. They it have also different. It depends on whether it's meat based or vegetable based. Yes. I would say Fatayr is vegetable based. Yeah. Sfiha is almost certainly meat based and open. And open. That's what I know. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. But again, it's how, you know, how we were, we were raised. Um, the south does it differently than the north, I believe. So, so for Tyre, uh, for those who, who are feeling left out, are these delicious sort of uh, vegetable pastries uh, or meat pastries where you kind of make dough and then you fold it over, uh, kind of like a small empanada. You, mm -hmm. you fold it over the, the, uh, the, the, the savory stuff and then you put it in the oven. Um, Meat-based ones tend to be called other things like sfiha or if it's closed, sambusik. 
typically I've seen Ftire be used for the like spinach or what else in Ftire? Um, really spinach and sumac and and sometimes uh, zatar, fresh zatar. Oh yes, yeah. yes, fresh zatar. Fresh, yeah. the actual fresh leaf. time, yeah, fresh time. So this um, is how Claudia likes her uh, cheese zatar manushe with tomatoes. I would like to add typically uh, mint and turnip pickles and olives and then close it. And in Lebanon, we say sahtan, which is enjoy or bon appetit when you're about to eat. What does sahtan mean? That means it means two healths. So and, um, one funny thing in Lebanon is they always want, you know, if you're being polite, they want to be even more polite. So if you say bonjour, which is good morning, they reply bonjourin, which two good morning. So sahtan means <laughs> two healths, not one, two. So that's, I think, how uh, we will end our cooking show for today. Edmund started eating my man Ushe, so <laughs> I'll, I'll try it. Um, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll hang around for a bit. Um, really, thank you so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. And, and we'll, we'll leave you with a, a view of the food. And yeah, let us know if you have any questions you would like to discuss.